Hello and welcome to the sidelines of the Pondi Lit Fest 2022. I have here with me today Kanchanda. He is a man of many accomplishments, but today for us, he is the master storyteller that he is. And uh, Kanchanda, I want to ask you, I want you to tell us the story of Bengal. Uh, to begin with, you know, um, we all have this nostalgia about Shonar Bangla. Uh, what is this Shonar Bangla? When was Shonar Bangla? When was Bangla Shona? And what happened to it? Well, uh, historically, what we know as Bengal today, even if you were to add the eastern part of it to, to it, Bengal was much bigger. Uh, Orisha was a part of it, Bihar was a part of it, Assam was a part of it. So you had the Bengal presidency. And uh, the idea of uh, Shonar Bangla was essentially about a very fertile Bengal, a fecund Bengal. Uh, so this was a Bengal which sustained everybody. So essentially the reference was to Bengal's agricultural wealth. Every bit of land was cultivable. There was no fallow land. And the river Hooghly and then Podda and then it was a it was basically a, a region irrigated naturally by rivers. And uh, a land which produced more than it could consume. So that's why it was also the region which, which saw foreigners eyeing it. I could go back and talk of uh, Bhaktiar Khilji's attack on Bengal, his conquest of Bengal. But in a way, the reason I mention it is also the decline of a prosperous Bengal. Now, prosperity in those days was not how we look at prosperity. Prosperity in those days was that I have land, the land produces, I live on the land. And it was a self-sustaining community like any other part of the country. So when the conquest of Bengal happens, that is when we also see the introduction of revenue systems, mm -hmm. tax collection, revenue collection. And often it was extortionist. And if you look from between, uh, say, 1204 and 1757, the Battle of Plassey. No. That is also the period when there is a lot of economic decline, cultural decline, social decline of Bengal. Uh, everybody romanticizes uh, Siraj of Baula. Sure. But nobody mentions that he was not fighting some great battle against the East India Company for the people of Bengal. He was fighting East India Company 
to preserve his own uh, kingdom of terror he was a he was a terrifying ruler uh, bengal like many other parts of the country again culturally did not have uh, an indoor bathing system oh. people did not bathe indoors okay so every inhabited area had either one large pond or a series of small ponds and houses would be built around the water body and uh, people would bathe there uh, or the river and there was a system to it men bathed in the morning because they had to go up to work work in the field or whatever and they came back home in the evening and bathed again and women usually bathed in the afternoon after the men had gone to work mm. and uh, their cooking was done housework was done or whatever now sirajuddaullah's men would the on horseback they would go from village to village looking for young women girls who would come out to bathe in the pond or the river in that afternoon period when there was nobody around pick them up and take them back with them and that is how women in bengal stopped bathing outside the house hmm. in many parts or they bathed after their men folk returned so these small changes in social customs cultural practices uh and we know for instance this whole thing of ghungat and how yes. it came that's the way it came in bengal also so the point i'm making is that the land saw many shifts away from where it was anchored hmm. in the 11th 12th century and by the time polashi happens the contrarian view to the prevailing view that there was great grief that bengal was lost in polashi there is a contrarian view that people actually celebrated and they saw it as liberation now let me just fast forward between 1757 and 1857 when east india company rule ends and the british rule begins directly colonial yes. rule again that period was a period of great instability mm -hmm. the zamindari system was being reordered the uh, social system was being reordered and you had the rise of the mercantile mercantile class in calcutta which sort of started re redefining bengal's economy bengal's uh, society bengal's culture and a new bengal and a new bengali started taking shape so this is the background hmm. to shonar bangla so shonar bangla hmm. then starts taking the shape of a region where its where its fields are verdant very fertile and its cities and by cities i mean calcutta uh, is the hub of 
hard financial, mercantile, economic, and even industrial activity in India. Because jute was a big thing. Jute was grown in East Bengal. And the factories were on the Hooghly in West Bengal, downstream Calcutta, so that, you know, the jute would be processed and put on barges, sent down the Hooghly, and exported from there, from Diamond Harbor, off to its various destinations. So, you know, it's a little confusing in the sense that, you know, you tol talked of the beginning of the decline from 1204. And then you talked about the relief when actually the British came and uh, you talked ab about the societal decline for those centuries that preceded it. And yet, you know, around the turn of the 19th century, uh, the Hindu-Muslim issue became again very rife in Bengal to the point where it led us to partition in 1947. So, first can you tell us, uh, you know, the nature of not only the mercantile rise, but the revival of Bengalis uh, intellectually uh, from the reforms they initiated, the role the Brahma Samaj played in it, because there is a lot of misunderstanding on this point. And I think there is no better pe person than you to clarify this point for our listeners. Uh, we have a strange habit of uh, demonizing our heroes. So, I think there is no better person than you to uh, set things on record correctly. No, then, you know, we also end up demonizing others. But, you know, as more and more Bengal, the birth of a new Bengali elite, hmm. uh, who were beneficiaries, no doubt, of the Permanent Settlement Act, whereby zamindaris were settled permanently, and uh, who were beneficiaries of uh, uh, the economic, the surge in economic activity in Calcutta. Uh, as my editor at the Statesman would never, you know, we, and in those days, Statesman still had Statesman building right in the heart of Chaurangi. And uh, it was a colonial, um, a building with a colonial facade and the building itself was very colonial. Uh, and he would keep on reminding me that this was the empire's second city. Mm -hmm. uh, the first city was London and the second city was Calcutta. The point being that this was the city which, which in many ways sustained not only the colonial economy, the, the colonial systems economy, but also the Indian economy. Decisions taken in Calcutta impacted everybody. Uh, and the rise of a Bengali elite, there are numerous examples, I will just give you one. Uh, Dwarkanath Tagore, the man from whom flows the great Tagore family. He was an entrepreneur. Mm. And uh, a very successful one. He wore diamonds on his slippers and uh, there were many others like him. You had the Malik's, you had others. and It was important in a sense that they then became benefactors patrons and sponsors of the arts. Now, if you look at 
the bengal renaissance there's no single one renaissance i mean or single one person who mm. leads or births the renaissance begins with ramohan roy raja ramohan roy himself came from a very wealthy family and he marshaled his wealth into creating or into birthing the idea of enlightenment mm-hmm. now he was a person of his times everything that he said everything that he did was not without a flaw true and despite that what he does is to encourage others to rise intellectually to to sort of show the world that we are not an inferior race and then there is a sequence of personalities somebody like ishwar chandra vidyas now ishwar chandra vidyasagar he was a sanskrit teacher he was a sanskritist he was a teacher and he was also the person who devised modern bengali prose but that by itself was not enough for him because he felt that with so much knowledge what do i give not just another class in sanskrit grammar or a lecture on bengali prose he fights for widow remarriage and he fights that battle against a great array of traditionalists hmm. the conservative is a wrong word over here but because he himself was a conservative so that he fights that battle and he wins it and widows in india they get the right to remarry you have michael madhusudan dat his amazing composition it it remains unparalleled you have although he was not a heavy heavy weight or he would not be considered a heavy weight thinker or intellectual but just a rebel like henry de rosio yes true you so you know it's a, it's a long list and we somehow think only in terms of bonkim himself exactly bonkim chandra chattopadhyay was someone who revolutionized the idea of literature of a bengali literature that it can go beyond the traditional form and and become a very powerful force of change social change political change cultural change mm. anand mot people often think that anand mot is actually directed against muslims <laughs> no it is not i mean sorry you have not read it you don't understand or get the backdrop of the novel uh, now again we come back to where we started there is so little written or told or taught about specific instances of our history uh, the sanyasi revolt yes now why did you have the sanyasi revolt 
what happened on the basis of which yes. Anandu Mott is then written. Now the colonial history of Sanyasi revolt is that they were brigands, they were thieves and thugs, sannyasis and fakirs. They would go from village to village and extort money and things like that. Now that is the colonial history. Sadly, even our post-colonial historians, they sort of revalidated that version. The real version is entirely, the real story is entirely different. The Sanyasi revolt came about because of the taxes which were imposed on pilgrimage, mm -hmm. on pilgrim sites. Now, sannyasis and fakirs, they lived on arms. And the, and the British, this, and, and they were a very powerful force of, you know, I mean, they kept traditions alive. They kept faith alive. They kept religion alive. And the sannyasis of Hinduism, the various sects, they were in many ways, they were the custodians of Hinduism. And the idea was to crush them. And then they rise in revolt. Mm -hmm. And this whole concept of Vande Matram, in, if you read Anandamot, it's a sannyasi yes. who sings it. So this power to weave reality and imagination. Reality was the sannyasi revolt. And then you have the, in those days, India did not exist as we know it today. Correct. But it was a land. And although Bankim would not have traveled from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, in his imagination this land existed. And then that, that whole idea of nation, nationhood, nationality and your uh, identity, it is the nation, the nationality and the nationhood which gives you your identity. That is taken forward. Now, you can say that oh, Bankim was looking at it from a Hindu revivalist point of view. Of course, yes. Hmm. And, and Bengal did witness a great degree of Hindu revivalism much before other parts of India did. Sure. So don't go by today's Bengal. The first book on Hindutva what is Hindutva, the idea of Hindutva, what constitutes Hindutva, was written in Bengal by Chandrakant Basu. And this, uh, I think, uh, I mean, I'm talking of 1892, hmm. when nobody was talking about Hindutva at that time. You had a series of books by Rajnara and Boshu identifying the Hindu, identifying Hinduism or sort of trying to define Hinduism. What is the Hindu ethos? What is Dharma? And then all of it then again gets further distilled in the Brahmo Samaj. So if you keep out the malignant diversions yes. which came in, uh, as part of the Shadharan Brahmo Samaj, yes. uh, the Adi Brahmo Samaj was the distilled uh, idea of Hinduism. Correct. So this was the Bengal we were looking at. We were, Correct. This was the Bengal that existed. And you had, you, I mean, it was not only in arts. 
people don't remember, people don't talk about it anymore. All the work which Bengal did or Bengalis achieved, the, the great achievements in science. Yes. And, and you had a whole series of them. Uh, you, you had Jagdish Chandra Bose, you had Meghnath Shah, you had uh, Shotendranath yes. Bose, you had Prafullo Chandra Roy. Prafullo Chandra Roy, who was referred to as the father of modern chemistry, he actually did not look at chemistry as just a science. He looked at it from the larger cosmic view of of a Brahmo Samaji. Hmm. So that kind of work was happening. So Bengal in many ways, those were the years when Bengal reaches its peak. Yes. So 1905, when this idea, obviously it was sufficiently disturbing for the British to see Bengal rise thus in every way. And uh, therefore, the outcry, the anguish at 1905 at the partition, call for partition. And then by the time you reach 1947, which is not even half a century, uh, the Hindus of Bengal realize that there is no survival in this land if we don't have our own homeland. So walk us through these decades and uh, you know what happened? No, actually the British were quite rattled. Yeah by 1857 and they felt that the only way they could rule India was by segregating Hindus and Muslims. Unfortunately, and I, I believe, I personally believe, there was no basis to it. Unfortunately, they believed that they could use the Hindus to create a large native support base. And the educated Hindu would be a clerk, they would, mm. the educated Hindu would be a magistrate and things like that. And the Muslim, we will keep them only as revenue generating peasantry. Okay. And the <coughs> partition of Bengal which happens is, of course it becomes a communal partition because East Bengal was always Muslim majority. And uh, East Bengal was also the peasant dominated part of Bengal. Apart from Dhaka University, you really hadn't much going. And uh, the other Bengal was mercantile Bengal. And was also seen as Hindu Bengal. Hmm. And the movement against the partition, it sort of also coincides with the Swadeshi movement or the rise of the Swadeshi movement. Because that was also the time when increasingly Indian produce was being swamped by British produce. It coincides with the Swadeshi movement and uh, you know that was also the time when when the British had become very aggressive yes. in dumping made in Britain goods on India. <coughs> so you had fabric produced in Lancashire mills being 
shipped all the way back and this is produced from cotton which is exported yes, from India the raw material went to Lancashire it is they make it into fabric and then they again ship it back to India hmm. and this whole economy was destroying India's indigenous in the economy. So we, we think of Swadeshi as something like, you know, an aggressive rejection of foreign goods, but it was emotionally much more deeper than that. Sure. So if you, like in Bengal, how it impacted, Remember there was that song, Mayad Dawa Mota Ka Pur yes. yeah. that, that the whole idea that I am used to wearing a dhoti or a sari which is produced on handloom or something as simple as the gamcha. Hmm. I am being now told to give up on that and switch over to cloth produced in Lancashire. Hmm. How can I do it? I mean, True. so, and, and then you have Obanindranath Tagore. He does the first portrayal hmm. of Bharat Mata. The first portrayal of Bharat Mata does not show the map of India. It just shows Bharat Mata as someone who gives you knowledge, who gives you food, who gives you your uh, the clothes you wear and who gives you dharma. And she is shown or depicted as a renunciate in a Girwa Bostro. Huh. And often when people say that <coughs> Tagore was against nationalism, they they are fools. So Tagore's views on nationalism as he has written them was very Eurocentric. The first war in Europe, its causative factors, the European idea of nationalism was <coughs> first create a nation, mm. then create a people then create a nationality and then to glue all three together you create your nationalism hmm. and their nationalism was exclusionary that's true to right? this day actually the term is mis is misconstrued and therefore i think pilloried because they conflate the european nationalism with what we legitimately they do it purposefully exactly they do it purposefully but we shouldn't get we should not and what we called nationalism. I mean, Europe, no country in Europe, in fact, even America, these are not civilizational states. Not at all. Uh, we are a civilizational state. Our nation was not defined by us, by cartographers. Our nation was defined by our civilization. And our national identity is defined by our civilization. True. So we have civilizational heritage, which gives us a cultural identity, which in turn gives us our national identity. And broadly speaking, this is our idea of nationalism. 
and if you look at tagore's writings which begin just before the partition of bengal and through that it is people think that vande mataram is uh, i mean those who object to vande mataram mm. they say oh it's what is this i salute you my mother or my motherland they should read tagore he actually says if bankim says that i bow before you tagore says i worship you wo amar deshen mat correct tomar pore thake so he goes one step further and again going back to where we started his ode to bengal o amar sonar bangla <coughs> where he says that bengal everything about bengal is bless blessed by god yeah. it's god's blessing and then of course that idea develops further and those who have read the full i was just coming to that of the national anthem of the national anthem the five stanzas what a magnificent i mean every time i read or listen to them it's it's a for me it's a very emotional experience so in fact you know that translation exists it's easily uh, you can find it easily on google and every time you have these wrong notions about who the national anthem was addressed to uh, read kanchan das translation and you and uh, you will not even have the slightest doubt as to who the uh, adhi adhinayaka is you know there is absolutely no ambiguity in no, that space at all all that is bunk yes you that, know but this is a this is a recurring no, that uh, was that was left is bunk yes. how it started because they could not tolerate the idea hmm. of nation taking precedence correct over ideology true yes so here we have then this whole thing of rakhi hmm rakhi as a protest Correct. against the partition sure. no that was 1905 1911 and then it goes behind Back. us but the real sorrow and grief begins in 1942 43 now ask yes so yes between 1943 and uh, the famine uh, that we all know 4 million people died uh, to the partition of bengal and kanchanda here i will dare ask you to tell me your story uh, you know because i'll tell you why because the punjab story has been written about a lot uh, the bengali story i think much to our detriment has remained uh, somewhere locked within our hearts we have not documented it sufficiently we have not spoken about it uh, films haven't been made sufficiently enough that are of wide acceptance i understand riti ghatok and all of that but you know uh, why is it that bengalis of today and indians of today have forgotten that there was a partition in the east that there was an unfinished bu- uh, business of uh, you know exchange of population there is it is even my own grandparents you know i why is it that uh, they did not tell me these stories as i was growing up why no. what have why have we kept this uh, this this tragedy so locked up no, again to just put a very yeah. quick context to it you have the famine of 43 devastating famine man made and it was a man made famine so it was churchill's policy which led to it but alo it's also true equally true maybe if not equally the but it's also true 
no the reason i mentioned the bengal famine is that of, of course it was churchill's policy which led to it it was True. evil there was very poor data keeping those days and in any case the poor didn't matter so we really don't know how many died <coughs> 3.8 million 4 million 2.1 million various figures exist but we know that a humongous number of people died and there is photographic evidence of children dying on the streets of calcutta you know as usual people migrate to the cities yeah. people of of children dying in the streets of calcutta of men and women dying on the pavements of calcutta dogs eating their bodies and things like that so this crime happened now there are two parts or three parts to this one is whatever the british government the colonial government did unforgivable the second part is that there was a lot of black marketing happening mm -hmm. holding and black market because there had a, 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 a separate entrepreneurial class had come up of holders during the war who would hold and then they would and and this spawned a huge black market and this was on everything from medicines to clothes to <coughs> essentials to food so a lot of people hoarded rice rice which could have actually saved many lives so that resentment then not only stays back it shapes the events of the 50s and 60s and 70s okay. of calcutta and the third factor was since you asked why is it that nobody talks yes i want to know east I don't think much of India was bothered about the Bengal famine. I don't think it it sort of knocked on the doors of India's conscience and morals in a way it should have. It didn't. And that's the fact. Otherwise india at that time by then <coughs> indians had become rich enough by indians i don't mean yes. indians per se but you had traders you had mm. merchants you had the uh, businessmen you had business houses uh, you had the villas you had i mean i'm not taking names but i'm I just understand. giving examples yes sufficient mobilization could have been done to minimize if not i mean probably you would not have been able to prevent it but to minimize the horrors of the famine now it's all very nice that we point a finger at the british colonial government we point a finger at churchill whose doctrine or policy led to this but we must remember every time we are pointing a finger there are three fingers pointing at us and it's important because the subsequent events of bengal get influenced in a great measure now you you mentioned about partition partition in the west was a one time affair true and i one of the things i started during the lockdown was to start reading about partition not not the train to pakistan kind of literature mm. or baba 
takes a toba swing or yes. whatever uh, but just the statistics government reports things like that now partition in the west was a one time affair more muslims actually traveled from india to pakistan or west pakistan than hindus and sikhs who came in so there was in its own way a transfer of population yes in fact as i said more went out yes. than came in in the east partition was and remains a continuous affair it actually begins in 1946 the direct action day riots in calcutta which signal what's going to happen what's coming you have the noakhali riots after that it is very clear you have the dhaka riots it becomes very obvious and till the end the muslim league was betting on a united bengal being hived off mm-hmm. um, and this is something which they hoped would happen pakistan was called pakistan but its eastern part was called east bengal yes pakistan's governed east bengal it's only in 1952 or 54 i am now forgetting that east bengal gets renamed east pakistan as east pakistan so they kept on dreaming that that this partition of bengal is artificial all of bengal will come to us let's wait for that and jinnah's reference that this is not the pakistan that i wanted or then he goes on to refer to it as moth eaten pakistan <laughs> this was this is what he meant calcutta was very much his desire that that, that is what they wanted exactly now you have people refugees coming in since 1946 47 up to 50 52 60 71 even today hindus are migrating out of what is now bangladesh and yet if you go in and if you do a google search <coughs> i will give you a very simple test say just search for india partition 1947 pictures show me one picture of refugees coming in from east pakistan or east bengal they just don't exist and that's why they were we were the nowhere men So nobody heard our story. Nowhere, nowhere people. Nobody heard our story. And uh, just two hmm. more, two three more quick points. From Delhi, the western part was closer. The view was more clear hmm. of refugees coming in, etc., etc. so delhi's response was also that much more in terms of relief in terms of aid assistance and those coming in from the east and for some strange reason jawahar lal nehru had a great intense bordering on hate dislike for bengalis authorities or concern over minorities in <coughs> west pakistan that driver behind the nehru liaquat pact was nehru wanted bengali hindus to stop coming in from east pakistan 
he puts them in camps which are called permanent liability camps yes oh god that term so you had pl camp 1 pl camp 2 pl camp 3 like that he labels them as permanent liability now if if i just think of it 75 years ago he was calling bengali hindu refugees a permanent liability and what was the cost of that liability? All they were entitled to. First of all, most people don't know that refugees were not called or officially they were not recognized as refugees. On official records, Bengali Hindus who came in they were recorded as migrants as if they came to see calcutta high court or the christmas tree in new market huh, and then forgot their way back so he dumps them into permanent liability camps he labels them as migrants he wants them to be stopped from coming in and then Nehru and his minions they come up with this atrocious charge that you know these Bengali Hindus darkies they are coming in from East Pakistan because of free ration and what was the free ration? a few kilos of inedible rice for only one month the first one month able-bodied men if i mean or men were not entitled to free rice what were the what were hitler's concentration camps actually called Labor camps. Labor camps. A reading of history or records of that time will tell us Nehru's government orders that all these PL camps have to be shut down. And we must now put them into labor camps. And labor camps are set up where you have to work. You come with only the clothes on your back. You are famished. You don't know what the future holds for you. You are made to work for one rupee a day. And then when the refugees, they start organize, organizing themselves and, and, they, and they decide enough is enough. You know, refugees were sent off to Andamans. Dandakaranya. They were sent off to Dandakaranya. And Dandakaranya project the manual labor was done by the refugees. Government didn't do anything. They just dumped you over there in the forest. And they said, now clear the forest. You have to, this is the plan. You have to build your houses like this. And this is where you get to live. They don't speak the language. They don't eat the food. They don't know where they are. So, then they start organizing and then they actually seize land in, in the outskirts of Calcutta and set up colonies. And that's a different story. But we need to understand where the 50s, Bengal of 50s, 60s, 70s is coming from. It is coming from this devastating famine the riots and the violence that precede 
and follow partition the inflow of refugees the manner in which they are treated nehru orders first of the, one of the first decisions of the nehru government now that you have got me going <laughs> huh? one of the first decisions is to order bengal used to get a huge share of jute revenue yes. jute which we exported that revenue bengal got a share and that was actually a big part of bengal's revenue hmm. one of the first orders that nehru signs slash it let the let the bengalis start he follows that up and we'll come to that later his great socialist policy of freight equalization which kills whatever little industry that still remained in bengal freight equalization what it did was supposing you set up a steel plant durgapur steel plant and you were carrying coal from dhanbad to durgapur it would cost you the same as carrying coal from dhanbad to kochi yes what sense did it make correct now nobody actually set up a steel plant in kochi but what happened was that it helped kill the steel plant in durgapur or discourage others from setting it up so the entire 50s goes in this great turbulence there is no food you have the food movement you, there is teachers wanted their salaries they used to get a salary of 140 rupees uh you had the teachers agitation you had the food agitation 60s was a political meltdown for bengal Uh, the and it also marks the rise of the left right. so left piggy rides the great resentment and seething anger there's agrarian anger there's industrial anger there's urban anger there's everything is in ferment and left just sort of rides the wave and is ascended and by the end of the 60s when jyoti basu comes in he lays down the doctrine which finally leads to the collapse of bengal industrial bengal obijit set man <laughs> so now often people talk of why why the naxalite movement bengal was the perfect launch pad you had agrarian distress because you had the jodhdar system where the people who actually tilled the land used to get a pittance of the produce in the cities it was the hungry generation they didn't know where the next meal is going to come from you the collapse of industry all of howra was actually it 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 had a large number of industrial units including the ambassador car mm. which used to be made in the same district uh, i know it wasn't really the same district you had to go up and uh, the downstream industry was all there and it was referred to as the sheffield of the east 
all that died. The jute mills started dying because West Bengal didn't grow jute. By, by then, of course, the demand for jute had also declined. <coughs> Mrs. Indira Gandhi's fatwa limiting foreign ownership. So all these were companies where the where British companies or uh, I think there were some American companies also which had ownership shares. So all that came to an end. And uh, then you have the Naxalite movement. You have the collapse of the United Front governments, the rise of Siddharth Shankar Ray, and a very torrid Congress rule. And then of course the left front comes in after the emergency. And unfortunately, while they did, did great work in agrarian reforms, which ironically came back to bite them uh, because the very people whom they had empowered through agrarian reforms and they had moved up the prosperity chain, they became the obstacle to Singur. Yes. I mean, they wanted the Singur land to be sold, but the people whom they had then hired to till their land, they said, we are not going to let you sell the land. Uh, the social decay, the cultural decay became very obvious. And Trinomul Congress, of course, we know what they have done. The revealing sight of so much money and gold recovered from the moles or favorite mole of uh, a Trinomul leader, the number two man in the party. And it's common secret that you see, political violence which began as a defensive mechanism became offensive with the rise of the left in Bengal. And now, of course, it has been totally weaponized where anybody who says anything against the TMC, you are either killed or you are raped or your house is burned or your family is chased out. So, Bengal's story in a sense is a very tragic story. And now we have reached a point where the able Bengali looks for any which way to get out of Bengal. And what is left behind are the aged or those who are fast approaching uh, senior citizenship or the riffraff. And uh, the so-called Bhadralok or the intellectual always a fate, always inconsequential and always dependent on crumbs thrown at them by government. Earlier it was the left front, now it is TMC. So they would do anything to protect their own existence. And that do anything includes 
selling their soul and their heart for their next meal. That is what Bengal has come to. True. So, Kanchanda, I will not really push you in a tight corner to give us uh, solutions for a resurgence because that is for all of us to find out. It's, it's almost impossible. At this point, it looks pretty hopeless. But I wanted this testimony to, uh, to come out. I wanted to record this and... Uh, no, Alu, sometimes I have wondered, you know, it's not that I have not asked myself this question. That I say this, but what have I done? But I don't feel enthused sure. and I don't think many Bengalis feel enthused. And I guess geographies, they go through cycles. So Bengal is going through a cycle of decline and that cycle has picked up speed. But as common sense tells us that you can sink this far and no far further. So hopefully the decline will be this far and no further. And uh, Or people will rise, people will rise and uh, I think we will and, and they will demand uh, government which is answerable, which is accountable. But what saddens me is that the average Bengali has sort of given in, you know, has thrown in the towel. Here I I have hmm. lost. And it's futile to fight on. So I might as well toe the line of least resistance. I might as well ensure my own survival. And devil may take the hindmost. Which, which is worrisome, which is unlike many other states. True. But Kanchanda, I think I would like to end on a, I would like to, I think, project my hope, maybe because I've been a Probashi all my life, but... Uh, you know, this Probashi romanticism... <laughs> no, it, 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 it... It has caused greater damage. No, but you see, there is compulsion that drives people out of the state by her own uh, statements. Are so, Mamata Banerjee, she reads out endorsements by someone living in California, someone living in Scotland, uh, someone living in Berlin. They could, I mean, see how good we are. <laughs> so this no, probashi Bengali to... notion of a great Bengal. No, no, to... it's not a great Bengal. The, I think the probashi understands, but probably feels helpless, but then has the right to hope. No, no, it's so then, human. It's yes. in human nature to hope. That's true. So Kanchan, I'll have to stop here now. I mean, thank you very much for your testimony, and this is what I wanted, and I'm so glad you spoke to us. And we have with us this story of Bengal, where it was, Although and I don't where know we have how many come people to. People would be interested. No, no, I am sure they will be. And uh, thank you so much for talking. My pleasure. Me. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be with PLF. Thank you.